2019 marks 30 years of Tim Berners-Lee's invention of the World Wide Web. And we should, of course, all be very thankful for that invention, um, because without it, none of us would really have a job, would we, right? Now, the web has been very important in innovation, obviously, the past couple of years. Um, but the truth is, as I guess we all know, that this innovation is being endangered. The, the web is under threat. And the problem stems from a lot of business models that focus on data harvesting. So we see many companies, instead of focusing on innovation, they focus on how can we capture as much data as possible. And this is not only bad for consumers, this also hurts developers, people who create APIs, people who create apps that use APIs. So there's also a solution, fortunately, and the same Tim Berners-Lee who invented the web is working on a solid ecosystem that aims to fix this. And what Solid aims to do is to bring back the competition by decoupling data from applications. And this style of web development will have a very profound impact on how we have to design APIs and how we have to build clients for them. And this is what I'll be talking about today. I'll start with a bit about innovation. Why is it so important that we look at a different way at the things that are happening on the web? Second, I'll guide you to rethinking about the way how apps and data relate to each other. And finally, I'll guide you through the implications on APIs and clients. Feel free to take as many pictures of my slides as you want. That said, I tweeted the slides. You can also follow them online if you like. Hashtag API days. So first, a bit about innovation. So imagine the world before the web, if you still can. There were lots of different kinds of hardware, different kinds of software, and they didn't talk to each other. So what does this mean? Well, innovation was essentially very hard. Because if you wanted to innovate, you needed to pick a certain machine, a certain kind of software, and this was the scope of your API or your application. So you're dependent on those things to do innovation, basically. Now, what the web did is the web brought universality. And universality means that anyone can use the web, regardless of the hardware they use, the software they use, whatever they bring to the table, be it a laptop, a cell phone, a smartwatch even, all of those things can access applications on the web. And what this means is that we get permissionless innovation, because we don't depend on whatever those vendors are doing to innovate. We build for the web, and with some testing, it works on all of those devices. And this interoperability is provided, of course, through standards. So permissionless innovation has been responsible for a lot of things that weren't possible before. Think about selling things secondhand to the entire world. Think about actually getting a taxi in Paris. This was impossible a couple of years ago. Uber has made it really, really easy. All of those things were possible because innovation is permissive. There's no one really deciding what you can do on the web. Unfortunately, universality has been under threat several times, actually, the, the past 30 years. I guess some of you will still remember the browser wars going on, where you had to use Explorer or Netscape to see a certain website. That is not universality, it's also not innovation, because that innovation is limited to one browser. And I guess we all remember the search engine wars as well, which means that innovation depended on how visible you were for a certain search engine. And the war happening nowadays, they're, pl they're platform wars. There are several platforms, uh, actually quite a low number of them, that compete for user data. And if you want to provide an experience, you have to interface with them. But then your data or the data of your users and their identity is controlled by such a centralized platform. And this, again, limits innovation. And the massive centralization of platforms that we're seeing today, it hurts diversity, it hurts innovation, and also hurts our choice. Because let's say you have the resources to build one API integration. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose Facebook.com or are you going to choose MyPrivateIdentityProvider.com? Obviously, you will choose the bigger one. This helps customers, right? But actually, the thing is, if we always choose the biggest one, then we hurt ourselves as well. Because this means that we depend on their innovation in order to succeed. And let's be honest, if you think about some of those centralized platforms, how well have they actually innovated the past couple of years? They don't innovate that much, they don't need to, because they have all the data. So our choice does not only limit consumers, it also limits ourselves and ties our innovation to the rhythm of innovation of those centralized platforms. Alternatively, you can of course become such a platform yourself and start collecting data. 
But that doesn't really solve the problem because then you have an increased competition, again, not based on what you want to do, but based on data harvesting and so on. So people lose ownership of their data, and this is bad for privacy and so on, but also just really bad for competition because it means that they cannot easily switch between applications, and this is bad for all of us. So if you're doing great innovation, well, too bad. As long as customers are locked into a certain platform, it's hard for them to move. So these are the problems going on with today's web and why innovation in many markets is actually slowing down. In order to fix this, we need to think differently about the relation between data and applications. What the solid ecosystem does is it enables people to use the applications that they want to use, but at the same time they can store their data wherever they want independently of that application. So with solid people own their own data and they share it with the apps and the people they choose. That's the big revolution. Whereas actually, if you see it, it's really logical, but this is not what is happening today. What does this mean? Well, I'm going to give you some examples in the social media ecosystem, but Solid is by no means limited to social media. So try to transform those examples into something that you're using yourself. In the case of social media, this is a quite common view, and nowadays, all of those pieces of data would be stored in one centralized platform. In the Solid vision, every single piece of data can be stored somewhere else. My profile picture is stored in my data space. We call this my data pod. My comment is stored in my space. If you reply to my comment, well, your comment is stored in your, your space. And even a piece of data as small as a simple like, well, the like is yours. The like is stored in your space. This is great for privacy, but also great for innovation, because now, wherever people go, they always bring their own data. And this is key. So this means that the whole landscape also starts looking differently. On the left-hand side, you see what we have today. So today, applications are a combination of a service and data. And this means that, simply said, I cannot share a Facebook photo with my LinkedIn colleagues. I have to move the data, I have to move the people, and moving those things is usually very hard, of course. So this is a competition that's not easy. And also, there's no synchronization, because if I update my availability in Doodle, then Facebook won't know about the events that I cannot attend, for instance. So this, this is all the kind of things that we're missing out on if we let apps take control of our data. On the right-hand side, you see such a personal data pod, and this is where people keep their own stuff. And then the role of applications changes, obviously, because then applications, they become views on top of the data. There are no synchronization problems because there's only one copy of the data. It's my copy. And as a consumer, I can easily change between apps, I can easily change between storage providers. So this, of course, is really handy. And as you can imagine, those arrows right there, they're APIs. So this is what we'll need to talk about in the end. Great for people, great for choice, great for privacy, but also great for developers. Because nowadays, if you have an idea that's much more innovative than, let's say, LinkedIn or Facebook, well, tough luck. You cannot enter this market because you don't have the data. Today's competition is based on data ownership, and data ownership is a winner-takes-all competition. You either become the biggest or you lose. And guess what? You've already lost even before you started. With Solid, you get a separate competition on two levels. On the one hand, there's a competition between applications. On the other hand, there's a competition between storage providers. And the competitions are independent. Also, it's not a winner-takes-all competition, because my best app for a certain task might be different from your best app for a certain task. So we get choice, and this also means it's a much more healthy competition, just like in the old days of the web. And of course, again, the arrow there means that we'll need to think very well about the APIs in between to make all of this work. This was the theory behind Solid. Now, what is Solid exactly itself? Well, Solid is an ecosystem, so it's lots of open source, it's a collection of standards, it's a collection of software, and Solid is also being pushed by a company called Interrupt, which is founded by Tim Berners-Lee. So basically, it's a new ecosystem that we're kickstarting, but the idea is not to be the OD player, the idea is to open up the market so there's lots of competition, because without competition, Solid doesn't work. So what's concretely there? Well, we've got data pods, and data pods, you can store whatever you want, your profile, your pictures, your videos, anything you can imagine you can store there. It's like a USB stick for the web, except that you control who can see what. Regarding applications, anything you can imagine, anything you can build, you can make it happen on Solid. Again, permissionless innovation is key there. And all of this is enabled by standards, and they're not new standards, they're just the existing web standards like HTTP, URL, and a couple of more recent ones like RDF, LDN, and so on. 
Of course, doing something like this comes with a couple of crucial challenges. If we all store our own, our own data, how do we connect it to other data? How can apps share data without having to agree on everything beforehand? And how can we integrate data from multiple sources, which is going to be necessary if we want to build applications? Well, we've got an answer to that, and guess what? The answer is actually hypermedia. Hypermedia-driven APIs are very useful for this purpose. Let me tackle each of these cases. So first, how do we connect data? Well, very simple, through hyperlinks. This piece of data, this JSON object, is me liking API Days Paris. Guess what? API Days Paris didn't have a like button, but I was still able to do it, because this is my data, so I can just create a link, and that's it. How do we ensure compatibility? Well, we use data shapes for that. And those data shapes actually have meaning, because detail, this is not just JSON, it's actually JSON-LD, JSON-linked data, which adds meaning to the data. So by recognizing those shapes, applications can be trained to recognize part of the data in my pod. But they don't have to recognize everything. It's layered compatibility, so they can just mix and match the pieces that they need. And then how do we integrate data? Well, it's just a simple matter of concatenating things together. So you collect things from all around, you put them in one JSON file, and it just works. This, of course, is also thanks to uh, linked data and the hypermedia that links everything together. So this is Solid and the technologies behind it. Let me now explain what the impact is on building APIs and building clients. Well, first of all, it means that we won't be able to do this. And this is what we're mostly doing nowadays, which is we build application logic. And inside of the application logic, we build HTTP requests to the APIs, the hard-coded sequence of requests. Why is this problematic? Well, first of all, data no longer comes from one source. So we need to send those requests to multiple sources, and you only know at runtime which those sources are. The second thing is that, since there are multiple sources, why would they all have the exact same API? That would be very difficult to enforce. So thinking in this way, where the requests are inside of the logic, will not work any longer. What do we need to do? Well, actually, we need to think differently about APIs. What I see nowadays are APIs that are built as monoliths. They're constructed from the top down. So the provider says, here's the API, give or take. It exposes certain functionalities, and it's a single custom interface. What we get are clients that are very tightly coupled to one specific provider. Even if you build, let's say, login with Facebook or post a message with Facebook, migrating to GitHub is not a matter of just switching URLs. You need to recode the whole integration. And that's very problematic in such a decentralized setting. So what we need instead is this and they are bottom-up APIs. Instead of having monoliths, APIs can be composed of mix and match pieces of functionality, which I tend to call API features. So you can say, look, I'm implementing this part, and this part, and that part, and you can mix and match as a provider. So that's, that means that not all providers have to have the same API, but they can reuse parts of APIs. And clients, they don't bind to the whole API, they only bind to the features they need. And the features they need are discoverable at runtime, again, through hypermedia. So those interface features, well, they provide the functionalities, and together, those define the API. If you want to read more about that, Google for a web API ecosystem, and you'll get our uh, internet computing article that explains this whole vision. If we, use the, if we use those vision in solid, here's what happens. Instead of having the application logic go directly to the HTTP requests, the application we code it with queries. And then it is up to a query engine inside of the client to distribute the query across different interfaces. And as you can see, this engine is smart enough not to always pick the same things, but it will choose the interface that it recognizes and have the best thing. So as you can see, not all data pods have to implement the same API. The engine is able to select the features that it recognizes. Now, of course, when I say queries, um, you might think like, hey, this is actually not, not, not a new idea. And indeed, queries are, made, are key to making decentralized applications and actually many more applications sustainable. Precisely because we don't know in advance what sources we need and what the API will be, and precisely because APIs, as we all know, tend to change. And of course, this is where technologies like GraphQL come in. And you might have seen the earlier presentation today, GraphQL is a new REST. So the idea of building applications with queries is getting some traction, I think, for good reasons, because it makes your um, application more resilient to changes. 
And certainly, in decentralization, where the network can change any moment, makes your uh, application also much more resilient to that. However, when I say GraphQL is a new REST, I say, well, yeah, I agree, and it has some of the same problems, because what we see is that GraphQL queries are not compatible with multiple APIs. If you have a query, it works with one server, but not with multiple servers. And in order to work in a decentralized environment, we need that kind of compatibility. And this compatibility is provided by other languages, such as Sparkle and GraphQL LD, which is an extension of GraphQL to linked data. Because your query needs to have universal meaning across APIs to make all of this work. In that sense, I think it's a bit ironic, because the GraphQL community prides themselves on simplicity, and have every right to do so. However, lately, I see some experiments that involve GraphQL queries over multiple APIs, and then more and more complexity start coming in. So maybe we should look at technologies that are already out there to see if we cannot just reuse them to enable cross-API queries and cross-API application compatibility. And in the end, if you think that way, things get really exciting, because you might think, hey, wait, this is quite disappointing for APIs because we're going to have to standardize on a couple of small features, basically, but no. The idea about queries is that it's declarative, so can, they can be run anywhere in the network. The client can run them, the server can run them, or they can be run anywhere in between the network. And this is going to make it really exciting for APIs because there's going to be a big variety of APIs that support queries. So it's not just going to be GraphQL, it's going to be much more, and it's going to be much more excitement and much more variety in APIs. So, I've explained to you the importance of permissionless innovation. I've introduced a solid way as thinking differently about the relation between data and applications, and I've explained what the implications are on APIs and how we will build clients. What's the important thing here? Well, data ownership by people is not just great for privacy, it unlocks permissionless innovation. And if we don't have centralized parties anymore, we will need to standardize API features, because if we don't, we're not building an ecosystem, we're building silos. So to make this work, we should all think more about ecosystems and how things fit together. And finally, if we use queries to do so, then we make uh, apps independent of concrete API requests, and API can change while our, um, our, while our applications, of course, they keep working. And this, I think, is a very new, exciting way to think about APIs and API technology. And this is how I believe that decentralization will impact the web and all the things that we're doing. Thank you. <laughs>